welcome to Books, Books, Books on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about Calming the Storm, a leader's handbook by Peter Adler, managing unproductive conflicts. And our guest for the show is, of course, Peter Adler, who is from the Accord 3.0 Network and many other organizations that deal with leadership, that deal with dispute resolution, and that make contributions of enormous value to the community. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you, Jay. Good to be here. Good to see you again. Yeah, thanks for uh, exposing me to this book. I, I think there's a great need for this book right now, and I have a few questions for you. But first, I want to ask, you know, what, what qualifies you to deal with calming the storm and to provide a leader's handbook for managing unproductive conflicts? For more than 30 years, I have been a mediator, arbitrator, hearings officer, uh, facilitator. I have spent much of my professional life just immersed in one type of conflict or another, some big, some small, some wide, some narrow, uh, and many of them highly political, very, very political, some very domestic, some very, very political. Uh, for example, I spent a year going back and forth to Papua New Guinea to deal with a one of the worst mine contamination cases at the time. I've also worked with two guys who were referred by the prosecutor's office. They got drunk at a wedding and uh, they beat each other up. And the prosecutor said, maybe you, Peter can help you work it out. And we did. There was mutual apology. So lots of cases, lots of examples. And in the book, there are a number of those cases that I talk about. This um, reminds me of the, the last book you and I reviewed together that you wrote. It was about uh, your time in India in the Peace Corps, which I, which I thought was a remarkable experience and a remarkable book. Um, what did your experience with the Peace Corps have to do with qualifying you to, what shall I say, appreciate the human condition so as to write a book on leadership and dispute resolution? Well, the two years that I spent in India, and that book is a bit of an imaginative memoir, it's, the bones of it are true, but I took some literary license and I had a lot of fun writing it. Um, and this was when I was in my 20s. It was, my, uh, it, it was sort of motivated by Kennedy and his call to arms for young people, but motivated with lots of personal reasons, wanting to get out of Chicago, wanting to see the world wanting to uh, avoid any work that I had to do that was expected of me by my family. So lots of so big chemistry of, of motivations. And uh, it was a seminal experience. So I look back and there are forks in the road. That was one of those forks in the road. But there's no straight line to the where it happened, per, what developed professionally. But it was a, a very, very interesting and powerful moment for me. You know, what I get out of this is that, um, you know, your experience, which is global in many ways, and it's legal in many ways, and it's people in many ways, uh, is about humanity. When we talk about leadership, we talk about organizing humanity. When we talk about dispute resolution, we talk about, you know, the part of the human condition, because right. people have disputes. Am I right? Absolutely. Uh, uh, storms are inevitable. Human storms are inevitable. We, we, and even, and some of them are small. Some of them are like little breezes that come in, and there's a bit of whining and a bit of complaining. There's a bit of something, and then it blows away. And then some of them are Category Five gales and tornadoes that really leave massive damage in their wake. Uh, I have wanted to work on all of them. I'm like a moth to light on this stuff. I am, a tr somebody called me a dispute seeking missile once. <laughs> so, and it's true. That's where I've spent my time. That's what I take value in. I, when I help sort out something and make it a little better, I feel like a million bucks. I don't make a million bucks, but I feel like a million bucks. Well, you're not in it for the money, are you? No, no. If, if I was, I certainly wouldn't be doing this. You know, <laughs> as Steve, Steve Jobs said, if you want to, uh, if you want to be a, if you want to be a leader, get ready for people to to hate you. And he said, if you want people to like you, sell ice cream. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I consider what I do as a sort of a version of leadership in which I bring other leaders to the table to help them sort out some snarky problem that they have. Well, you know, uh, although your book hasn't been published in 190 languages just yet, 
um, it seems to me that the principles that you are articulating um, cover culture, religion, language, everything. They they cover anything that could happen anywhere, uh, and they and they cross boundaries. They cross borders. Am I right? You are absolutely right. I, I and one of the things that I try to convey in this book is that. Um, there are big high functions that, and you would know this too from your, your own work and your own experience. And I know it from mine. I was a CEO of a big organization at one point and leaders have some primary functions. You know, they have to inspire and they have to keep people motivated. They have to nurture people. They have to hire, they have to fire. They have to navigate crises and deal with financial challenges. Lots of big things. And I think this business of conflict resolution is a small part of many other roles that happen in the life of a leader and in, in the trajectory and the arc of a leader's experience. You know, I was wondering, I mean, which which is the paramount consideration, the paramount teaching point in this book? Is it to show people how to be leaders or is it to show them how to resolve disputes? It's the second. It's to show them how they can use some pretty time-tested techniques and uh, notions and strategies as part of their portfolio of leadership work. It's not the main thing they do. It's not that you do it all the time. It is a cornerstone of many other leadership functions. So I don't suggest that this is, you know, the, the, the sole thing that everybody should focus on. Not at all. I think it's an add on. And I've seen enough of the good, the bad and the ugly in leadership as probably you have to know that this is one small role. It's not the totality of leaders. Yes, I understand. You know, we live in a time, Peter, as never before, where politics has created as part of a divisive movement in this country and in the world. Um, and and uh, it's, it's very important to deal with that. Furthermore, we have uh, autocratic leaders or would-be autocratic leaders uh, who, from a psychological point of view, are psychopaths, uh, only seeking power. Yeah. And so the question is, uh, what's the relevance of these principles that you're articulating uh, to the current conflicts in the world, the divisiveness in our country, the divisiveness internationally, and the psychopaths who are often in charge? This book will do nothing for the psychopaths, for the, those who are completely neurotic and crazy. I mean, uh, let's not mince words. We know that Donald Trump has a lot of uh, deranged behavior. I have no hope that this book would influence him. Uh, and it's not aimed only at the, the high level appointed and elected officials. I'm interested in leadership of men's and women's volleyball teams and of soccer teams and of the library board and of the, you know, it, leadership is not up here, it's all. It takes place over lots of different kinds of organizations. So I'm not. I'm interested in the, in many different types of leadership. It, I think it might have some influence on some smart legislators and some smart appointed officials. Uh, in fact, I know it can because I know officials who do similar kinds of things, and it's part of their already part of their portfolio. But I'm just as interested in the leadership of the local neighborhood board as I am of all that, or of the library board of directors, uh, or of think tech's board of directors, of any board. So leadership isn't confined to you know the Donald Trumps and Kamala Harris's and their vice presidents. No, and some of them are hopeless. We're, they're they're not going to be interested in this stuff. They're they're following their own path. And uh, maybe it's just one that's got to get exhausted before they can do something different. Hmm, you raise an interesting point, though, at least in my mind, is that um, some people, as you said in the book, some people are suited to be leaders. Other people are not suited to be leaders. How can I tell? But if I'm faced with and researching somebody who is in a leadership position, how can I tell that person has read your book? How can I tell that person is a good leader? What do I look for? Well, the, here's the number one thing that I would look for. Is anybody following them for whatever set of reasons? Is anybody following? You know, I used to lead outward bound expeditions on the Big Island during a certain hiatus in my life and career. And we used to say, you either lead, follow, work together, or get out of the way. 
there, there are only four choices when you're dealing with sort of a, an ongoing challenging situation. Those were high risk expeditions, uh, you know, on the ocean and on cliffs and in the rainforest. And leadership was evident. We always looked for the leaders in our group. Who were the influencers? Who were the thought leaders? Who were the ones that uh, took charge in circumstances that were less than favorable? Who were the ones that other followed? The question is, who's who's got followers? Who's following somebody and for what reasons? And um, again, we're not going to influence, I'm not going to influence Donald Trump or you know, some psychopathic leader in some other state, that's not going to happen. But I'm really interested in other kinds of leaders who are alert and aspiring leaders, younger leaders, younger people who say, I want to do that. I'm I'm hungry to do that kind of stuff. How would you distinguish a good leader, at least in this definition, from a cult figure? Um, that's a very hard question. I, I think the cult, fig the cult leaders are pretty evident and they reveal themselves over time, whether it was Jonestown leadership or whether it's, you know, the uh, in, in other, any other setting. Uh, there are, uh, you know, strange forms of leadership that pop up. And we know in uh, World War II from Mussolini, Hitler, Lazza and others, that uh, there were there were aberrations in what we, any of us would consider good leadership. Uh, in fact, they were examples of really bad leadership. I think leadership is not what people say. It is not what they feel. It is not what they think. It's what they do. It's what they actually do. Uh, and, you know, that's that's what we look at. That's what we look at. We look at the performance. You know, Jay, there are clusters of theories about leadership. There's one that says, oh, leadership is all about charisma, the divine spark that comes from the gods. And there's others that say, no, it's about traits. You know, uh, somebody is born with certain kinds of inclinations, whether it's through, uh, you know, DNA or whether it's through nurturing. And then there are others who, you know, say, no, no, no. It's about a moment when something happens and someone rises to the occasion. The moment meets the person. I happen to think the my favorite one, which I mentioned in the book, is Winston Churchill's definition. He said leadership is just moving from failure to failure with enthusiasm. <laughs> well, well I, I think leadership takes many different forms, and I, I don't think we need to put it up here on a high-level pedestal. We do that. We tend to do that. We tend to want leaders to do everything and expect answers, and when they don't, we're disappointed. I'm much more interested in the moves they make, in the specific moves, and the moves they make when there is a conflict that they are have to resolve or that they are involved in themselves. It's the tactics and moves. Last night, my wife and I were, we discovered a Netflix movie, a series called Zeus in Chaos. And chaos is spelled K-A-O-S, chaos, and it was starring Jeff Goldblum who is brilliant in this series. And it's about Greek mythology. It's about Orpheus and Eurydice. Um, and you meet all these characters that are related to Zeus, that are mythological gods, and they have such interesting personalities. So then I'm looking at your book and I say, my God, there's a reference to Greek mythology here. Wow, what a coincidence that is, because I'm, I'm stoked about Greek mythology right now. What does Greek mythology have to do with leadership? What can we learn? This is a really good question, Jay. It's a good, fun topic. So one of the things that I recall uh, from my graduate student years was something that said, and using the example of the Greek gods and then the Roman gods and Aztec gods, and, and that, that was that all families are dysfunctional, and they're just dysfunctional in different ways. And the Greek families were like that. They were completely dysfunctional. Many of them were totally dysfunctional. They were murderers, and they were killers, and they were all, all kinds of things. The character that has interested me greatly from Greek mythology is Proteus. And I mention him. I write a little bit about him. Just a short blurb. But Proteus was one. Was a minor character. He was one of uh, Zeus's, uh, you know, seal tenders on a little island. Uh, and uh, but he had this very interesting quality, which I think per is pertinent to leadership and to calming the storm. One was that he could foresee the future. He could see what was going on, and he had the knack and the ability to kind of look in the crystal ball and see what, what was going to happen. And the other one that was he was a shapeshifter. 
he could change. And he didn't like to tell people what was uh, lie ahead. So he was always changing forms. And he could become a seal. He could become a lion. He could become a mouse. He could become anything, Proteus. And there's a Protean style, which actually a couple of very famous psychiatrists have written about. And that Protean style has a lot to do with leadership because leaders aren't one thing. There are many things. And at one moment, they can be the person who is calming the storm, and that's who this book is for. At another moment, they may be the happy warrior or the warrior or the black flag of wars on, on their deck. So I don't think leadership is one thing. It's many things. It's, and uh, we, as leaders, they perform many different functions and roles and are called upon to do different things. I was, when I was a CEO, I had to do a lot of different things, and not all of which were pleasant and happy. And Jobs was right. I should have sold ice cream. <laughs> you know, um, yesterday we had a talk show involving stories, stories in dispute resolution, talking about stories as they relate to the effort to resolve disputes. And then I look at your book and I said, holy moly, what they were saying is in your book. It's and you talk about the value of stories. stories. Can, can you talk to me about the value of stories yeah. in well, dispute resolution? Absolutely. So I think stories and storytelling is a primal way that humans communicate. Uh, you know, uh, Lily Tomlin, my favorite American philosopher, once said that she believed that humans developed language about 80,000 years ago out of a deep need to complain. <laughs> and and we you know in the, in disputes people have complaints and part of the the tack that most of us take who do this work is we want to hear the stories we don't want to go through endless repetitions of them but we want to draw out the stories the context the deeper context and the meaning of the stories and what the what their story means in the current context of trying to find solutions to a problem I actually you may not like this as a lawyer. I actually believe the world is made of stories and stories make the world. I understand that we're all made of carbon at some level, but I think for humans, the world is made of stories and we make the world with stories. And the stories are powerful and there are big stories, law, science, music, math. Those are big stories, and they're, but they are stories. We've given language to it, but we work on disputes in small stories and we wanna hear those. And out of those stories, some smaller and larger truths start to emerge about what is driving them and where solutions might lie. You know, it strikes me that uh, the, the, this story approach is not only relevant to dispute resolution, it's relevant to the larger question of leadership because a leader is faced with dilemmas. He's faced with hard choices and options that may, as you said, may not be pleasant. Um, and the story can help him what make decisions that will give him better leadership. So do you agree that stories as a way to approach problems uh, are useful not only in dispute resolution, but in leadership in general? I do. And I think about uh, some leaders, you know, I think about Obama, who was a great storyteller, or I think about Billy Canoy, the former mayor who's passed away from the Big Island, who was a wonderful storyteller and engage with people at a, at a very visceral level when they tell stories. And, and uh, so I, you know, it may turn out that there are some circumstances where that any kind of prolonged storytelling is going to not work. There are some high conflict moments where you got to get right to the heart of the problem and start exploring solutions. But for most of us, most of us, most of the time, Stories are powerful. They're, they tell us uh, who you, who we are, who you are, who I am. And one of the things we're trying to do is bring about, uh, you know, some some harmony in the stories. Now, you know, there's there's an old legal notion out of Blackstone's Law and beyond, the, even deeper, and it's embodied in a couple of Supreme Court cases called tertium quid. Tertium quid is a notion that actually has found some legal traction. And it's the idea that there are two different stories, and part of what has to emerge is a third story that builds off the two stories. That's dispute resolution. That's the coming of the storm. That's finding some ground that people can uh, resolve their differences. And I will tell you, just to relate this back, it's harder and harder 
when the politics is crazy, when it's crazy. And we know the world is nervous and twitchy and the politics intrudes on a lot of stuff. Let me add that so does the media. You yeah. know, we get uh, social media, we get email, we get text, we watch television, and we are mm, fed so much information and disinformation and confusion that has to have an effect on our thought process. And and my my feeling about it is that um, this kind of media blitz that we get in today's world is not helpful to make good decisions. Your thoughts? Yeah, similar. You know, uh, there is we were sort of in the fire hydrants and floods of information and storytelling, and we're we're almost overloaded with that stuff, and so. That is uh, sets the stage for a lot of disinformation, a lot of made up facts, a lot of, uh, you know, strange stuff that goes on. And learning how to become discerning in the media is challenging and difficult. And we all have our own cognitive biases. So we lean into Fox News or MSNBC or, or some other social channel. And so we have to be we have to learn how to be critical thinkers about this stuff. And it's hard. That is not easy. And even smart people are very vulnerable to to uh, misinformation, disinformation, distraction and so on. I, I, it's not easy because now that we're working in a high speed information world. Yeah. And you have to be able to back away from it and think yeah. clearly. Um, you have to have the ability to. Um, uh, in, to have introspection with all of that. Let me tell you my case study, Peter. I wanted to offer you a case study and see what uh, your reaction would be and how it relates to some of these things we've been talking about. When I was about 20, um, I was the steward of a large um, nonprofit federation uh, summer camp in the Catskills. And there were thousands of kids in this camp, and there were dozens of staff who worked under me. Uh, I was in charge of the kitchen, uh, the cooking, the service, and cleanup, and so forth. It was a great job. Um, and part of it, of course, had to be leadership to make sure everybody, you know, did their jobs and was happy. One day, my staff got into this fight, and it was terrible. They were all fighting with each other physically. Uh, so this was a social work camp. It was steeped in social work, and I cared a lot about social work. So I called them all out on the on the uh, on the back the back lawn of the mess hall, and I asked them to sit in a circle and uh, let's do some social work. Let's do some group therapy and find out what was troubling them. What would lead to what would lead to this kind of controversy, whatever it was, and. Um, they did that. I was proud of myself for doing the social work thing. But my boss, who was a European and very hard-nosed guy, he came out and what he did was he, he criticized me in front of my staff that I was trying to social work. And he said, how come you left the door open to the mess hall while you were having this, um, this you know, uh, social work experience? In fact, the rats can get in. Uh, and uh, I had no answer for that. Dealing with, you know, impossible demands and demands of the people on top of you, because it's part of leadership is to deal with demands on from people on top of you. So let me mention the book, okay? I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if it's coming clear, but I want to talk about the book is now published. It's out, and it's out from a, uh, a group called Roman and Littlefield, which has just been acquired by Bloomsbury. And it's got 15 sections and lots of 75 rules or tips, however you want to characterize them. But at the front end, I have a, a punch list, a bunch of bulleted notions that says, you want to calm a storm? You want to try and deal with a, a problem? Here's some things. Here's And these are embedded in the book. And this is like the short version. One is you do a little preliminary reconnaissance. You talk with people individually if you have time. Two is you got to pick the right moment. You got to find the right moment to do this. And there's a little guidance in the book about that. Then you got to give your your effort and your role a relevant name. You got to say, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a, your boss, but today I want to do something different. I'm I'm here to help have a little bit of a, conver a conversation in which you shape solutions. You got to create a pause in the conflict, and the timing of that is quite important. You may have picked the wrong time. 
uh, it may have been a total accident. You left the door open and the potential rats might run in. You got to, um, but you got to create a pause in the conflict. Can, for example, you might have said, can we meet later on at four o'clock today and stop arguing right now and let's work, talk it through later? You got to build some rapport. And I don't know how much rapport you did or didn't have, but I presume you would have because you're, uh, you know, you're a wonderful human and you're generous in your uh, relationships. You got to maintain a laser focus on the problem and the possible solutions. You got to help them generate ideas. You got to make plans for how you're going to do this, but be ready to change them. And during the pause, you got to treat everyone like a friend that you can be honest with. That may mean sometimes meeting privately with them and sometimes together in form. And you got to let everyone talk and and tell the story and ask smart questions. So. You know, that's like the punch list. It's on page one of the book, but the book itself reveals much, much more detail about that stuff. I don't know if that helps. Who knows, Jay? Maybe uh, you were dealing with two psychopaths and a third psychopath who came out because you left the rats in. But, but the <laughs> point, my point is there is a way to do some of this stuff. There is there is a methodology, and it and it is not wishful thinking. And it doesn't work all the time doesn't work all the time. There may be people who have no goodwill and have no interest in doing this. And you as a lawyer, you know that sometimes that's the case and you got to go to the mats. But most of the time I found people who finally sit down, they want to find an amicable solution. They may be snarky and gnarly on the way getting there, but they're, they're hungry because sometimes the consequences are pretty dire. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking back to that case study. I'm thinking, Probably I, I could have ha handled it better with my boss. Um, you're right. I could have done it at another time when it was safer um, to, to allow the screen door to be open. I could have checked the screen door myself uh, just to be sure, you know, that things were safe. Um, but but it does raise all of this raises another question, actually, Peter. You know, even the best the best of us, the best decisions. This is out of John Steinbeck of mice and men um, uh, make mistakes. We make mistakes and and we, we can make decisions that are wrong. We can pick options that are really not optimal and, and we can get bitten by the result even if we had the best of intention, the best plans laid by mice and men. And then you find yourself uh, having to pick up after the mistake. So what about that? Where does that fit in leadership? Well, where does that fit in terms of perpetuating your, I don't want to use the word authority, but your your influence over the people you're leading? So, so I, I look, I think leadership is hard. It's hard, especially if there's a lot of external or internal stresses that are running with that leadership. And so it's not easy. I don't think there's one simple pathway. And, you know, it, it's also a zigzag. It's not a straight line. Uh, I, re I remember reading about a, a Buddhist shaman from Malaysia or something like that, who said, humans zig and zag. We don't move in straight lines. Only demons go in straight lines. When you see someone moving, they're probably a demon if they're moving in a straight line. So leadership is full of ups and downs and ins and outs. And it takes good leaders to kind of own that in their own way. You know, the, the, the leaders that don't do that uh, and refuse to ever admit a mistake are surreal. They're, they're, you know, surreal. My sense is we make mistakes. I made mistakes. I was a CEO. I had 40 people working for me, and I had very big challenges in an, an organization that I was called on to run in the mainland. And I made my mistakes. But uh, you know what? You suck it up and you move on. You, as Churchill said, you go to the next one with enthusiasm until you say it's time to get out. There comes a moment you say, you know, I've done what I can do. It's time to move on. That's also a gift if people recognize that. And uh, a lot of leaders cling on and they stay on too long. Um, that's that's not about you. That's a, just a general thing that we've seen. See people who can't let it go. They can't, you know, can't let go of that role. They've become addicted to the power. Mm, yeah, wow. Well, we've met them, haven't we, in the practice yeah. of... We got to move around nationally and even locally. Well, I, I wanted to, uh, you know, mention that I your your book reminded me by length and by writing style, 
with Tim Snyder's On Tyranny, if you recall that one. I read and, that. Um, he, Terrific he's book. a great writer. Yeah. And your book reminded me of him and the style of those subjects were obviously very different, the style of it and the brevity of it. Um, so uh, is this a new form you've found to write short this way? Your prose is really good. You get right down to it and you use words that are so carefully selected that, you know, one remembers what you said. I think when I look back on some of the other writing I did, and even the India book, it's overwritten. It's too much. Even though I had just a hell of a lot of fun writing that book, and it was just a, it was fabulous. I re I've never written anything more enjoyable than that about that uh, India forty and the circle of demons. That two years that I spent in India, but I have learned. I've tried to write shorter and punchier and clearer, and uh, I'm still working on that. I'm still learning about that because I think it's. Uh, I think Mark Twain once said that no sinner was ever saved after the first five minutes of a prayer or sermon. So if you got something to say, get how do I get to it? How do I get down to the essence of it and convey that? You know, Hemingway, I remember uh, reading some profiles of Hemingway, and he wrote three pages a day. That was his goal, three good pages. And he then he'd go fishing or hunting or do whatever else he did or chase girls because he did a lot of that too. So, but but the, his writing was to say, you know, I'm I'm writing and I want to just do a few things every day until and and I keep at it. There was discipline on that. Someone asked him once. They said, Mr. Hemingway, how do you write? And he said, I just sit over the typewriter and open a vein. <laughs> And it's getting <laughs> ideas out there and then really crafting them down. So, and I admire that in other writers. I like writers who can get to the point and uh, which is part of the reason why academic writing is frustrating to me because it's overdone, overwritten. We can't get, we don't really get the essence except uh, at the end or maybe in brevity at the front end in an executive summary. So I admire good writing. John McPhee is a writer who knows how to do that. He knows he's written dozens of books about uh, nature and every, all kinds of things. I mean, he once wrote a book about Bill Bradley and his, you know, how he was on the basketball court. Uh, so I admire the way that kind of craft and I keep hoping that I'll uh, be able to emulate that. Well, you certainly have achieved it in this book. Uh, you know, every chapter opens with a Rocco Sacco statement. And it says, wow, wow, I got to know more about this. <laughs> well, let me ask you, uh, Peter, to uh, read some of your prose, to read from the book, to uh, show us exactly how it works. The structure of the book is it's got 15 sections and 75 tips, rules, whatever you, uh, whatever you want to call them. So there's about four or five in each section and there, there, there's you know number one two three and four roll out and then there's a longer story at the end and, and the story itself is bracketed i start with my own personal case something i worked on and then i talk about a more legendary or epic case that helped inform that or helped see, give me inspiration and then i finish that section at the end of each uh piece by telling what happened in the case. Somebody could read this and just say, I don't want to listen to all Adler's you know, long stories. I'm interested in 75 tips. And so that that you can read it at that way. Or if you like stories, you'll read the, the end part of each section. So here's one. This is uh, negotiation has a ritual. That's number 61 in this book. And you know, for years I've been studying negotiation. I teach advanced negotiation courses. It starts with a quote from a, a, a Conklin and Weil, a couple people, it says, trying to get people to reason in a way that is not natural for them is like trying to teach a pig to sing. You don't accomplish anything and you annoy the pig. So, and then when I say, that's just the introduction, that's a quote. <laughs> then I said, there is a deep ritual to most negotiations. And you know this, Jay, because you've been involved in plenty, an ordering and pacing of things. And though rit rituals differ in form from place to place and culture to culture, they give storm commerce a template. And the first part of that ritual involves climate setting, climate setting in which people tend to telegraph signals and foreshadow what is to come. The messages say this is going to be businesslike or it's going to be tough or it's going to be hard or it's going to be friendly. So there's, a, there's some telegraphing of the negotiation. The second part is context building. Uh, the second part is context building and people tell stories 
that set the stage and backdrop for the offers and demands that are to come. The third part is bargaining and problem solving. Uh, and there are challenges. Uh, who goes first can be a tricky piece of business. And the fourth part of this whole ritual of negotiation is bringing closure. And if there is a deal, there will be reassurances, memorialization, preparation for implementation. And if not, we're going to try and figure out ways to close the door, but leave it a little crack open so they can get back to the table. So this is just an example, and I'm not reading it verbatim. I'm telling you what's in there. And there are 75 pieces like that in here. Short, one page. You know, they're easy to read. They're easy to digest. And they have mini stories. Every one of them has a mini story. The story of Proteus is one of those stories in there about the protean style of being able to change directions and change shapes. So I there's a lot of fun in this book, too. A lot of interesting stuff that for people who want to read it. And people who just want a punch list, it's in there. Well, this sounds like a handbook that you could use um, as a as a syllabus to teach people about these things. Am I right? Yes. And it grows out in part of some teaching that I've done. Would you say, Peter, that this is your best work? Oh, I probably haven't done my best work yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that that uh, that leads to my last question is, what's your next book, Peter? Well, I'm still pondering a few things. I'm not quite ready to talk about it, but I've been pondering some ideas about uh, a, a, an imaginative uh, journey with a couple of immortals from who are famous in Chinese literature. Uh, Cold Mountain was his name, Cold Cliff, very interesting poet. And very mysterious. People don't know a lot about him. But I've read translations of his stuff. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting if a guy stumble across these guys and they're still around? So I've been thinking a little bit about that. I have no idea. So, And, you know, like in all writing and all life, there are false starts. I might try this out. And if it doesn't click, it won't click. So who knows? It'll come to you. That's the way great creativity does come. That's Peter Adler. Uh, he's the author of Calming the Storm. A Leader's Handbook, Managing Unproductive Conflicts. Thank you so much for joining us, Peter. Thank you, Jay, as always. Aloha.